And on my right, we have Dr. Don Sanders, who's going to be in favor of hip resurfacing for the high demand patient. Uh, and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Sanders first. Okay, thank you very much. And the reason why would we resurface hips versus doing uh, total hip replacements? And the reasons are very simple excellent long term outcomes, bone preservation, and return to activity, especially unrestricted high level activity. And those are, that's probably the single most important thing that I think I, I get out of resurfacing a hip, where I get patients that I can return to activity where I have little or no concern about what activity they're going to be involved in. There's clinical advantages that are there, and they're documented, including the bone sparing. Obviously, we spare the femoral neck. You get better biomechanics by having a spared femoral neck. You don't get stress yieldings, especially in zone one and zone seven. In fact, if you look at a hip resurfaced versus a hip that's replaced in the area of the neck, you actually get increased bone density over the period of the first nine months versus decreased bone density in every other aspect. You don't have stress shielding. You have good stability, lower dislocation rates, probably better balance better proprioception, return to sports, and the leg length discrepancy issue becomes uh, less of an issue. You're pretty fixed on where, where you're going to put it. The key to doing this is to pick winners. <laughs> pick winning patients, pick winning implants, and pick a winning approach. And you have the opportunity to do that. By winning patients, we mean choose the right operation for the right patients. Males have done better with this operation than females. They have higher survival rates versus small females with small bones. Young, active patients, better survivals under 65, and you look for good bone quality as opposed to inflammatory disease or osteonecrosis or hip dysplasia, all of which have lower bone quality than garden variety osteoarthritis. If you look at McMinn's series, and this is going to be the largest, largest series, his 20-year survival now is at 97 percent. And this is all diagnoses, and this is also with a much wider selection criteria than even I use. Males are at 97.8 percent, females at 94.7 percent. And in my own hands in the last 10 years or so, I've done about 203 patients, almost all males, 98.9% .9 survival, and that's at about 8.7 8 years. You want to choose a winning implant. You have the Smith Nephew of Birmingham, the BHR, versus everybody else. That's the bottom line. And the BHR is probably different from everybody else. It has better construction, better metallurgy. It has the longest and largest historical database with the least modifications, has the lowest revision rates, and the fewest complications. So why not do it and do it with a winning approach? Here we all, we all are here doing anterior approach. So I think we can do this and we can do it with an anterior approach. And there's a reason to do that, first of all, you get the benefits of anterior approach by saving the muscle and tendon attachments in terms of their preservation. And as we've talked about all morning and you've talked about uh, and we'll continue to talk about the improvement of the component positioning. Now that's critical in this operation especially. When you look at the history of the problem with this operation, one of the big problems, one of the ugly problems is the pseudotumors. And the pseudotumors, which were reported back in, in 2008, you had 28 hips, 17 patients. They almost all occurred in females. And they almost all had bad abduction angles or too much anaversion. Pseudotumors were associated with component malposition and edge wear, which is associated with the component malposition. They also seem to be higher in smaller bearings and in females. So what, we, what I've done is basically is we've modified the approach by using the fluoro, taking advantage of the fluoro to align the implants, align it 
both with the femoral component and with the acetabular component, both in terms of the depth and in terms of being able to put the acetabular component in the position that you want to put it. So in conclusion, basically hip resurfacing with the BHR is a better alternative to total hip in selected patients, primarily young patients, men who are active and under 55. It's easily converted to total hips if needed, preserves the bone, and has clinical results of over 120,000 of them and show a low incidence of failure. Excellent results in men under the 55, normal biomechanics, low risk of complications, and complications reduced in success rates enhanced by improved selection of patients, implant, and technique. No offense, but I reject everything that you've just said. <laughs> Clearly you have great outcomes and, uh, and I appreciate that. But let me just ask, I, I'm curious, uh, show of hands in the audience, who lets their patients run after a total hip replacement, anterior approach total hip replacement? Runners going back to running? Who does not? Okay, half, half and half. People don't let their patients go back to running. Okay, so there's a split. Not everybody feels nearly as confident with the anterior, with their total hip replacement as, as you do after your uh, joint resurfacing. I don't think we have the data to answer this question yet. So I'm going to give you almost exclusively my opinions at this point. Do patients return to sports? So if we look to Joel's patients, our golfers can. We know that. Our runners can. We've got that written. But then I moved my practice to Nashville, and I joined this guy, Thomas Bird. And Thomas Bird, and with him came the Titans, and with him came the NFL, and with him came the MLB, and with him came the NHL. And by the way, a year ago, I didn't even know what those things meant. Thomas said to me, would you consider doing hip resurfacing? He'd heard me say, I don't believe in that operation. Will you consider doing hip resurfacing? I said, no, I, I really won't. Why would I, why would I do that? It's, it's a terrible operation with terrible outcomes. He said, well, nobody that's playing major, the major leagues and nobody that's in the NFL is doing it for their health. They're doing it to play. So I get back to the question, can they? Can they do it? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I said to him, well, why wouldn't they be able to do that after an anterior approach hip replacement? I, I would let them. He said, no, they'll dislocate. What? my patients don't dislocate. Um, but this is a hyperphysiological requirement and they're undergoing these massive impacts they can dislocate. It's unlikely they achieve complete muscular function, a functional return. So, well, we don't know that, but okay. If you say so, insufficient motion, we're gonna have to test this and then, but the big thing, the periprosthetic fractures they might be up against after a total hip replacement with a stem in it, it goes away with the hip resurfacing. And, this is where these arguments come from. We have just heard them from my very worthy opponent here. I reject all these premises. I, I think that hip resurfacing is a bad operation. It's bone sparing, sure, but the outcomes after revision surgery are not good. They have an unacceptably high early failure rate and early revision rate compared to total hip arthroplasty. And while we can choose certain studies to look at across the board, Across the history of this, our, this surgery, the, the early failure rate is high. And the revision of surface replacement arthroplasty to then total hip arthroplasty has dismal 10-year results. So the revision surgery is a bad operation. And these pseudotumors, and yes, they're ugly, they are bad actors, and they make for a terrible biological environment to then go in and operate at, for the rest of that patient's life. We don't know what the, what the contemporary dislocation rate of resurfacing is. It's not published. We heard today that the contemporary dislocation rate with anterior approach hip replacement ranges from zero to 0.2% in, in, in the hands of users that have been doing this surgery for a while. So I'm gonna put that up against whatever the hip resurfacing dislocation rate is. Periprosthetic fractures can and do happen around hip resurfacing, and they're as bad, if not worse, than those around a primary total hip revision, uh, a total hip replacement stem. And I believe, and I've seen in my patients, that muscular recovery, motion, and performance after anterior approach total hip replacement is equivalent to that achieved in posterior arth arthroplasty and in resurfacing arthroplasty. 
Bone sparing. It may be bone sparing on the femoral side. It's clearly not bone sparing on the acetabular side. That's been shown in volume analysis, uh, volumetric studies. The, again, unacceptable high rates of failure. So, but looking at the average time to revision between a total hip arthroplasty in young patients versus the hemi resurface, the resurfacings and those in and out of use at this time, as so many of them have been recalled, and they just keep getting re-recalled. But at any rate, the, the um, time to uh, revision surgery is very, very early in many of these patients' lives. And the early revision, the rate of early revision and reoperation is incredibly, incredibly high, and I don't know how we let this continue. Furthermore, the survivorship of the revision surgery after uh, resurfacing is terrible. So uh, after revision surgery from a hip resurfacing, a 45% complication rate and a 38% revision rate within 10 years, that is unacceptable data in contemporary medicine. I cannot stand it. So I asked myself, why would we continue to do this? And I think we continue to do this because exactly as my very, again, worthy opponent has pointed out, we just have failed to study it with respect to the total hip replacements. So the replacement dislocation rate, this is, in, this is data from the 90s and uh, early 2000s, but in the, early, in the 90s compared to posterior approach hip replacements, the rate of dislocation with a hip resurfacing approach is 1% versus uh, posterior pro approach 4%. What is it with anterior approach? Well, you know, everybody's different, but it's pretty low, and I think we need to study that closer. The periprosthetic fracture, sure, if this is a periprosthetic fracture we're talking about, I'd say, yeah, I'd rather have this than a fracture around a stem, but that's not a contact periprosthetic fracture. This is. This is a periprosthetic fracture after uh, a contact injury or, or a, a true traumatic injury, this is what we're talking about, and that is a difficult reconstruction. This is a difficult reconstruction, and I'm not saying that the total hip reconstruction is easy, but I think they're similar, and I don't think this is an argument against total hip replacement and contact athletes. In summary, I think hip resurfacing is a bad operation. I know that it is, in some people's hands, very good, and we've got small series with great long-term outcomes, but by and large, for over 40 years, that surgery has shown itself to be a bad surgery. I would put my anterior approach total hip replacement up and my self-selected, so yeah, if I only pick the winners, I'll take my, my anterior approaches and put them up against resurfacings. And I really think in the elite and professional level athletes, we have something to offer. I think it's a better long-term result, a lo better long-term surgery than resurfacing, and we should collaboratively come together in the next couple of years and write these papers. Thank you. What we have the ability to do with the anterior approach is make an operation that perhaps does have some long-term issues much, much better. Do you do all of your hip resurfacing by anterior approach? Yes. And are you fairly unique in that? Yes, there's not very many people who are doing that. Yeah. There's a study of mortality rates at 10 years after metal on metal. Okay, well maybe they had higher revision rates, but look at the death rates compared to uncemented total hips. And this is match controls for age, for sex, for comorbidities, and for socioeconomic status, okay? Death rate for Birmingham's on the top and cemented total hips on the bottom. I mean, in, uncemented total hips. So you may save them for some long-term complications, but you're gonna kill them off soon. <laughs> <laughs>